Tonight I'd like to invite you over to the book of 1 John chapter 1 and we'll begin reading in verse 1. 1 John 1 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 reads that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we come before your throne asking your blessing on the word that you might bring it forth to our hearts and our minds and our understanding, that you might be glorified and that we might have a better revelation, a deeper revelation and understanding of your power in our life and what you've given to us in giving us salvation. Bless, Lord, again tonight, and we'll thank you, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message tonight is that ye also may have fellowship with us. That's the Lord wanting us to have a relationship with him. That's what fellowship is. When you stop and think about fellowship, it's a friendship. And by the way, it's something that benefits each other. But in this particular case, we are the benefactors, really, when it comes to the fellowship with our Heavenly Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing that boggles my mind. God sees it as a benefit to him. He desires it. He covets it. Listen, he and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that is their focal point. That's amazing to me. How do I know that? Because he gave us his Son. He said, you are so important. I am giving you my Son. He didn't do that for the angels, and he didn't do that for anybody else, but for you sitting in here tonight. That just boggles my mind. I just want to say this. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight, and every night that you come out, and every Sunday that you come out, But I believe you come to worship the Lord. I believe you come seeking to hear from Him. And we can mark it down. He is faithful to do just that, isn't He? He's faithful to reveal Himself. And so tonight as we gather together to worship Him, we come with great expectations because He is faithful in doing that which He said. And that is that He would reveal Himself and that He would draw us closer and give us more understanding. If we lack wisdom, we ask Him for wisdom, right? So if there's anything lacking tonight, be it known unto each and every one of us, God has the answers. And so tonight as we look at this, I want you to understand that God has a special revelation just for you. And I want to take you back just a little bit, and don't go over there, but in the Gospel of John chapter 11, just like he did for Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died. Do you remember that? Jesus came unto them and, and Martha said, oh, listen, had you been here, Lord, you would have uh, healed him. He would have raised from the dead. And then if you remember what the Lord told, he said, I am the, the life and the resurrection. Martha, do you believe that? And she said, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection day. And then that's when he said, I am the resurrection. And what did he do? He raised him up that day. Do you think they were expecting that, Mary and Martha? No, they weren't expecting that. When you come to the Lord, come looking for the unexpected, because God will grant it every time, especially when it comes concerning our relationship with Him. As we look at this, we're going to see John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is desiring to bring us, the believer, into the same relationship that the apostles enjoyed with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, eternal life. And we'll see some things here that are very important. Look at verse 1 with me for a second. Look what it says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So this is important. We're going to look at three things. The word of life, the manifested life revealed, and a new fellowship that God wants us all to have and to enjoy. So hold your place right here. And I want you to see something because can you guess who the writer is of the book of 1 John? Josiah, do you know? Do you know who that is? (laughs) What color was George Washington's white horse? Hold your place right here. He knows the answer. Go over to the book of of John, chapter 1. And I want you to see something here. Look what John says, because John is the writer of 1 John, in case you didn't know. 
the Apostle John is the, is the writer. And I want you to see that the things that he had seen and heard in the Lord Jesus Christ, he brings back out in this letter that we're looking at here. But look at verse 1, and I want you to see something here because the word of life is what was told to us in the first verse. And here, in this portion of Scripture, the Holy Spirit breaks it up. Look at verse 1. In the beginning was the word, not the word of life, but it was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then notice this, he says this. He says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and he is the word, right? But now notice verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So he is the word of life. He distinguished them, right? He said, Here's, here you have the word, but he's also the life. And we also know through the gospel of John also, he's the truth and the way, the truth, and the life. So keep that thought in mind, because that's important. And here's what I want you to see. Did everyone who saw the Lord Jesus Christ see His glory while He was on earth? Did everybody see His glory? And the answer to that is no. Not everybody saw His glory. This is a revelation that is given to those who seek the Lord, and this is the revelation that God wants all His children to see and know, not just at a one-time event in salvation, but in their walk with the Lord. God wants His children to see who He is, that He is truly the Word of life. And God wants us to have that life in us, and that is in a relationship that he wants us to have with him. So go back over to the book of 1 John. And again, look at verse 1 with me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Now, this is an important statement, because first of all, we understand that when the Lord walked on the earth, only those that got saved, only those that were touched by the Lord saw the glory of the Lord. And not everybody, listen, when the Lord was crucified, in fact, the disciples were in dismay, were they not, when that took place? And yet the Lord was telling them these things and they did not understand them till after he rose again from the grave. This is important to understand because at the point of our salvation, the first time that we meet with the Lord, that's a revelation, is it not? The first time, when, the only time, when we get saved, there's only one time that we get saved, but that's our first encounter with the Lord. So here's, let me ask you this. When the disciples got saved and were walking with the Lord, did they understand everything God was revealing to them? No, that's important to understand because we are like, we're just like the disciples, other than the apostleship calling, all right? In the sense of we're human beings, and God is showing us things, and we're communing with Him. When we open up the Word of God, we're communing with Him. When we pray, we're communing uh, with Him. When we gather together in worship, where two or three are gathered together, there's He in the midst of them. And yet we can be missing some things. Is that true or false? We can be missing some things, and we are missing some things. And the reason why I, can, I know that is because the disciples missed it. I looked at it, and I, I can see it in my life, and that's okay. That's a good thing, because it, to know that, then we say, Lord, I want those things that I have missed. I want to understand those things that I have heard and read in your word in a greater way. Question, did the disciples get a better understanding of who the Lord was after the resurrection? Why? The Holy Spirit was given. It was not given up until that time. And he told them that. And now I want you to see the manifested life revealed. Again, in verse 2, he says, For the life was manifested. That's revealed. That's what that means. It means to make known that which was hidden or unknown. That is the will of God. Hold your place right here. We're, we're going to go back uh, to the Gospel of John a couple of times. So you might want to have a little marker in there. But go to the Gospel of John and look at chapter 14 with me for a moment. And look at verse 16, 14, 16. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says this, And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. And he was not given yet. Even the Spirit of truth. That's important. And if you want to know who the Comforter is, just pop over to verse 26 right there. But the Comforter, which is who? 
The Holy Ghost is a big thing. May I tell you, the Holy Ghost is the key that unlocks the wisdom and understanding of God because he is the guide to lead us into all truth. Without him, we won't get to the truth. We may possess salvation, but we will not get to the fellowship that God wants us to have, the knowledge that he wants us to have. And that's what that means. The word fellowship there has that understanding that we are communing with the Lord and we are walking with the Lord and he is revealing himself and giving us his wisdom and understanding. So notice this, verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. And by the way, listen, the disciples didn't understand this. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. He's saying, but you know, for he dwelleth with you, and notice, shall be in you. You know this, or you should have known it. Verse 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. Watch this, and will what? manifest myself to him. I'm going to reveal something that he had not or she had not seen before or known before, and that is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Judas saith unto him, verse 22, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? He didn't even understand it, did he? Not yet. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So this is important that we understand this truth. Jesus was giving them a revelation, a personal revelation, and they were not grasping it. Were these disciples saved? Absolutely, they were saved. But they were not grasping what the Lord was giving, and God is wanting us to have something that we may not have right now or not have to the extent that God wants us to enjoy. The longer you're with somebody, the more you learn about them. Is that not true? In fact, I don't know if you've ever had a friend growing up that you were really close to. You could almost tell what they were thinking or before they even said it. You ever have something like that? Maybe even, I had a friend that I grew up with since I was seven years old, and as a teenager, they couldn't tell us apart over the phone. They'd always call us the, each other, the other person's name, and that's because we, we hung out probably too much, right? <clears throat> but with the Lord, that's a good thing because God gives us a greater understanding of what he's doing in our life and what he wants to do in our life. So back to the disciples just for a moment. In Luke chapter 24, don't go over there, and 21, we have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The Lord had been telling them and revealing to the disciples all the things that were going to come to pass, how he was going to be betrayed and how he was going to put, be put in the hands of sinful people and how he was going to be crucified and how on the third day he was going to be resurrected. This is such an important truth here. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were talking and the Lord approaches them. What, what is this that you're talking about? And, you, and you, you look grieved, you look troubled. And he says, don't you know, haven't you heard? And he began to tell them about Jesus. And here's what they said. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. That's what they said. Question, was Jesus the one that redeemed Israel? Yes, but they did not understand it yet. So God, and by the way, listen, how did they get that understanding? When the Lord broke bread, do you remember what they said? Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened us to scriptures? And what he did was he was talking about himself in the Old Testament. May I tell you, the Old Testament was not anything new to those disciples on the road to Emmaus. They had read it over and over and over and over again. This time, God gave them the revelation. And when it came from the Lord, their hearts burned from within them. And it moved them. How did it move them? It motivated them to go back to the other disciples and tell them what had just happened. May I tell you something? When we get into that kind of fellowship that God wants to have with us, boy, listen, the whole world will know. We will want to tell everybody because it will become so real, it will be unbelievable. Listen, the disciples knew who the Lord was, and yet did they not put their foot in their mouths at different times with the Lord? 
I think of Peter, you know, the all deny you. No, he didn't understand the Lord, did he? Wait a minute, there was another place where he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord and the other disciples. And he started to speak up, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And a voice came out of heaven and said, this is my son, hear ye him. You know what he was saying? Don't get in front of the Lord. And he got quiet and he feared and the Lord told him not to fear. But here's the thing, God is wanting us to follow him. Not for us to take the leadership and to, and to say this is the way that we're going, but say, God, I need you to give me understanding or I'm going to miss it. So he says this, I've come to give you something. And he's talking to the disciples, so it's, we're not talking about eternal life. What is the theme of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's getting ready to leave that he's going to give them? Think about that situation. The Lord's getting ready to go to the cross He's getting ready to be separated, but he knows what the result of that is going to be, and that is that he's going to give something to the disciples. Look, you're, you're right here at John 14. Look at John 15. Look at verse 11. John 15, 11 says what? These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be what? Did you see that? John 15, 11. Your joy might be full. Look at 16, 24. Look at verse 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be what? Okay, question tonight. Is your joy really full from the Lord? If not, you're in a good spot to say, God, fill me with your joy. Ready? Look at verse, uh, chapter 17. Look at verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is powerful because the Lord is getting ready. Go back to our text in, in 1 John. The Lord's getting ready to be crucified. And he's talking about a joy that to the world would be perplexing. You're going to the cross and you know what you're getting ready. You're going to get separated. But there was a fellowship that he had with the Lord that captivated. Listen, a mortal being in the presence of God, you'll want to go nowhere else. If you can stand in the presence of God, you can wrap up everything in the world that would be exhilarating and it won't even touch a candle to what you will experience in the very presence of God. That is a, a thought to fathom because that's what heaven is going to be like, but God wants us to enjoy that here on earth or begin enjoying it here on earth and it will be culminated and fulfilled in heaven. God wants to do a transforming work in our life with his presence in our life, by the way, which we already have through the power of the Holy Spirit that will bring joy unspeakable and full of glory that will cause us to be detached from the things of the world and start clinging to the things that are spiritual, to start coveting after those things in the right sense of the word. So as we look at that, Look at this new fellowship in verse 3. Ready? That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at this, the first inclination might be that, well, he's talking about the fellowship when they walked here on earth. Question, did the disciples' fellowship improve with God after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, or was it better before the resurrection? After the resurrection. Because they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and then when Peter prayed, things were going on, and the Lord was using them, and Peter preached, and 3,000 souls were saved in one day. All different types of things turned all the way around for those disciples. They had entered into a relationship that they had never experienced before, even with, didn't, remember the Lord said, it's better for me to go away, that the comforter might come, because then you're going to enter into a relationship where you're going to see that I'm in the Father, and, I, and He's in me, and you're in us. And He wants us to understand, listen, listen to this verse again, watch this. This is the fellowship He's talking about. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have the fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ now remember who's writing this first john it's john and god used him to write the gospel of john and tell me if he's not what he's thinking about when he says verse four and these things write we unto you that your joy may be what gee i've heard that somewhere before haven't you because of the fellowship he has with the father you know what he's understanding? How to have full joy in the fellowship. He, listen, that relationship 
completely turned him around. He's understanding things now, would you not say, that he did not understand even while the Lord was on earth. May I tell you something? Listen, remember Thomas? Thomas, you believe now because you see, he said, blessed are those that believe and have not seen. That's you and I. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit has been given and we can enter into a fellowship with God that we have never experienced before, even though we may have been saved for a long time. And it's something that will grow and will never stop. God is beginning a work in here that will be culminated in heaven. In this whole introduction, really, of the, of the first epistle of John, he's starting out declaring this new fellowship that he wants us to enjoy. So again, this fellowship reveals our death. Jesus, who is our life, has also taken our death on the cross. Is that not true? So listen, what we're finding here is if Jesus didn't die on the cross, then we're still dead. But because he died on the cross, because he's our life, right? He's our life because he lives. That means he also is our death. We were supposed to die on the cross also with him. And then now he died and he, and he rose again. Why? To give us eternal life. Hold your place here and we'll come back. Look at the book of Romans and look at chapter, chapter 6 with me for a moment. This is the revelation that he's speaking about. This is the event that the disciples began to understand and not run in front of the Lord and not come up. These are two fishes and this, this boy's got two fishes and some loaves over here, but he opened up his mouth, kept going. But what are they among so many? He, he could have stopped there. Lord, you know, you, you want to feed the multitudes, and, and here's this boy with two fishes and, and five loaves. Let's give it to you, Lord, take it and bless it. But he said, see, they, didn't, they did not know the Lord like they knew the Lord afterwards, because then they were, my goodness, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. All different kinds of things were taking place. God gave them a little bit of a taste of that when he sent them out, remember? And then they were talking about talking about what they had done. And the Lord said, but more importantly, not, you know, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Why? Because of the fellowship now that you have with the Lord. Look at Romans chapter six and look at verse five, speaking about Christ being our death and our life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his what? Of his what? Of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his what? There's the death, there's the life. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. May I tell you, I have not understood this for most of my saved years. I just thought it was a vicarious thing. It is something that the Lord actually did. He has crucified the old man on the cross. It's dead. If you can see it from the word of God, the old man has no rule over you and I. The new man has it if we'll walk by faith in that truth. That's where the faith is at. What are you believing in? I'll tell you what we believe in, what we see more than what we hear from the word of God. Can you have victory over sin? Oh, no, Brother George. No, no I'm just, you're looking at yourself. I know that because that's what I did. But then I did not look at what the Lord had said. And the Lord said, see, this is the fellowship. If you're going to be, look, when you fellowship with somebody, you begin to sound like them. You begin to know what they're going to say because you know them. When you have the fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, you start saying what they're saying. You start walking in that light instead of the old man. So notice what he says here in verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. He's freed from it. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? Live with him. And that's talking about now on this side of eternity. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, he says, reckon, that word is a banking term, take into account Ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we're in fellowship with the Lord, God's going to bring that truth unbelievably to the forefront of our understanding. That's where our victory is at, in what he's done, not in what we are seeing. If you look to what you're seeing, you will never live by faith. Because faith is trusting in what the word of God has said, not in what you feel, not in what you see, but in what he has said. 
Otherwise, I'm just like the world. You know what the world's seen? Somebody who was crucified and dead. They don't know the resurrection. But you and I as believers know the resurrection, do we not? You and I know the resurrection. I hope so, right? And God wants us to understand the resurrection power that we possess because of our eternal life. Why? That's where the freedom's at. That's where the joy is at. Not the head knowledge, not the history stories, the fact of the matter that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it's the power of God that sets us free. All right, so he says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto Christ, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then notice this, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. I will be the first one to tell you I cannot overcome sin. But I will be also the first to tell you, God has made a promise. And here's that promise. He has indwelt me with the Holy Spirit that can. I can believe George Jangel, or I can believe the Word of God. That is life. If I believe George Jangel, what do I have? Death. If I believe what the Word of God is telling me, then I'll get outside of my thinking, and God says, He has given me the victory. I can either choose to walk in the victory or walk in my wisdom and knowledge as a believer and have failure. Where do you want to walk? I'm tired of walking in the death march. I'm tired of seeing what I'm supposed to do and trying to do it and wonder why it doesn't get done. So I'm, I'm turning it over to the Lord and saying, I'm believing you, Lord. I want to watch you do it in me, just like you've said. Did we die in Christ? Have we risen in Christ? If so, then reckon it so. That's what he says here in verse 11. And then because of that, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. This is what sets us free. Look at verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And that is today. We won't need the word of God in heaven. We'll be perfected then. But God wants us to join him in this fellowship, in this relationship. And in order to do that, we need the Lord in a great and mighty way. We need to walk with him. We need to know what he is saying and what he's thinking. And walking in that truth means accepting it and believing it, not just saying, how do people excuse that? How can you look... How can I look at that and excuse it for so many years? Well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, bless God. No, I'm a victor in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sinner saved by grace. And don't think I'm harping on the song. It's a good song, but that's not where it ends. That's just the beginning. All right, back to our text, and we'll finish up here. And again, John 17, 3, he tells us that we might have his joy. Look at verse 3, and we'll finish up. 1 John 1, 3 says this, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what He's, listen, that's what He is wanting us to get for ourselves. He is not saying we have this fellowship. How do you like it? Does it look good to you? No, He's not saying that. He's saying, we want you to know you have that same fellowship because of eternal life. You can enjoy the very same thing. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye may also, that ye also may have fellowship with us. Who's the us? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it joined them in the same thing that they had. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. When we tap into that wisdom... And God has to break. You know what we need to do? Listen, we need to ask God that fellowship, Lord, for me. I don't understand, Lord, everything, how it takes to make it happen, but I know you're the one that makes it happen. So, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit that you've indwelt me with, I want that fellowship. That's the fellowship that I want with my Heavenly Father that he has promised that ye also may have fellowship with us. Tonight, do you want that fellowship? with your heavenly Father, with God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? That's the question.
Then look at verse 4 again. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which ye have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So listen very carefully on this. God is saying if you're in that fellowship, your walk has been changed. Not by your power, but by God's power. When the light of God comes in, it casts the darkness away. When the light of God comes in, you're not even going to look to those things that are dark for fulfillment. Do you think anybody is thinking about anything in the presence of God but God? I'm sorry. You won't either when you get there. You won't either. You'll see other people, but your focal point is, oh, God. Now watch. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, this is the fellowship. Now listen, this is the fellowship we want to enter into and walk in darkness. We lie. I don't care how long you've been saved. If you're being defeated, you are not walking in that fellowship according to the word of God, not George Jangel. Don't fool yourself. I got, I got all I need. You're walking in, if you're walking and failing... You're not into that fellowship. That, listen, the fellowship will take care of itself. When you enter into the fellowship, you're in the presence of the Lord. That, he will reconcile that. Now watch this. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. He's talking about you with the triune God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Did you see that? When you're in the fellowship, the blood of Christ is doing an unbelievable work. So if you're walking in the light, and I want to remind you of something, and it might be worth you turning over there. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. This is why God says he gives you the opportunity to get a crown and rewards. He's made the way for us to get it. We, this is something that he will do through us as we ask him. God, I want that fellowship with you. God, I, I want that experience with you. So Ephesians chapter 5. Remember, he, we're walking in the light, right? Look at verse 14. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest. He's talking to believers. That was me. I have been awoken now by the word of God to this new truth that I want. And I pray you do too. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall what? He gives it. Everything that is good in God. Are you listening? We don't have to do anything for him except for ask him. Give it, Lord. And here's the good thing. It's his will. We just have to have enough faith to ask him for it. So again, the question is tonight, do you want that fellowship? Oh, oh, and let me just, let, look, look, you read verse 14, right? Keep that thought. He's going to give us the light to overcome the world. And that's because of the fellowship that we have with him. And then he says this, he, he says, verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he says this that we're familiar with and Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. It's all a work of the Lord. We try to MIT it and have a board of directors meeting over it, and we overwork it. And God says, I've already done all the work. Just ask me for it. It's just that simple. You can't get it on your own. You can work all you want to. You'll never, you will never have victory if you lean on the flesh. You have to look to what God has, by faith, you have to come to this realization, I died. My old man has been overcome by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection. God has already done that for me. Why am I trying to redo it? I'll never do it. God has already done it for us. All we have to do is receive it. Look. It's not, you don't have to feel bad. The disciples didn't grasp it either right away. And then they understood, didn't they? And now John's telling us, don't MIT it, just receive it. 
and enjoy it. That you and I might have the Lord's joy. Isn't that what he said three times in John 15, 16, and 17? So tonight, here's a simple question. Do you want that fellowship that God wants to have with you? If you do, do you have enough faith to ask God for it? And if not, just say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Give me the faith. And then when God does it, and we see it, and we experience it, that will be your witness. He changes the life. Did you see that? That is the introduction to 1 John, and then you'll understand what he's talking about. He's not talking about sinless perfection, but he is talking about victory in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that he wants us to enjoy as we walk with him. And it's ours, already bought and paid for through the salvation that we've already received the down payment of the Holy Spirit for the asking. So I ask you one more time tonight, because it's important. Do you want that fellowship that God wants to have with you? And if so, I don't know what to say. Hang on to your boots because you're in for a ride. Because <laughs> God will take you places that we don't even know about in our spiritual walk with Him. He will show us great and mighty things that will awe us and bring us to the place of worship and prayer to where there's joy and great excitement and that's contagious. When God gets a hold of somebody, it'll spread like wildfire. Oh God, do that in me.